Well, good morning again. We are starting a new series today, which will run throughout the Sundays in February, the month of love, right? Valentine's Day, a uh, week from tomorrow, right, guys? You ready? Okay. You've been forewarned. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> we're starting this series, and it's all based on uh, one of my absolute favorite life verses, which comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. We're going to read that in a few moments together, but it's a verse that I reference all the time, which talks about loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And oftentimes I'll paraphrase this, this by saying loving God with all that we have and all that we are, so that when uh, we hear that, we think about the whole idea that God is calling us to live a life of love, it all comes back to this. But we're going to get to that in just a few moments. The title of this series is, is called Yellow Bricks Forever because it is borrowing from some of the ideas that we see in The Wizard of Oz. And when I say yellow bricks forever, when I came up with the title, uh, it has a double meaning. First of all, I want us to think about uh, how Revelation describes heaven, where the streets are paved with gold. That's exactly right. So there's, there's gold as far as the eye can see, right? So the streets are paved with gold. But the other idea is that it's not just about like, a distance or a place. It's also about the building blocks, if you will, for how we are called to live our life in relationship with God and with other people, so that when we come to recognize that God does indeed want us to love him, other people, and yes, even self, with all of our heart, and with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, and all of our strength, that we can come to have a better idea of what that means for us as Jesus followers. We're, we're not perfect we're striving to get there. We, you know, the, we believe that we'll never make any mistakes. But it comes down to our intention and the way that we, we root our priorities. That even when we have as our best of intentions to love people and to love God and to even love self with all that we have and all that we are, we make a mistake. Then what the change in the priority and intention does for us is that it goes to help us fess up for the mistakes that we make. To find reconciliation and restitution if necessary. And to truly be about living a life of humility and of love and of grace and of mercy. And so Jesus, when he gives us this verse that we're going to read here in just a few moments, it has huge eternity-altering implications for all of us. Now the context for this in Mark chapter 12 is Jesus is being confronted by some of the religious leaders and elite of the day. And what they are doing is they are trying to trip him up or get him to maybe contradict something so that they can use that against him. As Jesus' fame and popularity in the region is beginning to go up, the religious leaders felt that they were losing some of their grasp and some of their control. And so as they are working with Jesus trying to trip him up into this faith trap, they start by asking him a question regarding divorce. So this is the pretext to our verses that pick up in Mark 12, verse 28. They go to Jesus and say, okay, so what happens in heaven if someone is married to someone and, and uh, that person, or the, you know, one of the spouses dies, you know, what happens in heaven? Especially if one of the mates remarries and remarries again and whatever happens. And Jesus is like, oh, you're missing the whole point here. That in heaven... God is going to be the center of all of our relationships. All of our primary connections are going to start with God and flow from there. Here in the world, the way that we live right now, we have our primary relationships with, our, with people as a way for us to seek ways to grow into the way that God wants us to live. With other people. So we connect with a person, whether it's a spouse, a child, a parent, a best friend, you know, whatever. We, we connect with people to live out that life of love that God calls us to. But once we get to eternity, once we get to heaven, God becomes the center point, the hub of our wheel, the start of the yellow brick road, if you will, for how we are to live our lives in eternity. And so Jesus then is asked a question about, well, what is the greatest of all the laws? Now, friends, let me tell you, the... Ten Commandments, right? How many are there? Ten, right? As that developed after the Ten Commandments, 
the laws, the commandments, the rules, all of these things began to take on a sort of life of their own, like our own legal code, right? We have our Ten Commandments, and then it goes on for thousands and thousands of pages. And uh, at the time of Jesus, there was over 600, some 613 different laws, commandments, rules, regulations. And so the religious elite decided, we're going to use this as a way to try to set a trap for Jesus so that he can, maybe as I said a moment ago, offer a contradiction about what is the greatest. And so Jesus answers with these verses. Let's pick up with Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. Jesus is asked, which commandment is the most important of all? And then Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus goes on. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. What Jesus did is he took the entire religious and legal code with hundreds and hundreds of rules and laws, commandments and regulations, and he boiled it down to a simple statement. You are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And I'm going to go ahead and add a bonus one, that you love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus took from the top ten, right, the Ten Commandments, to the entire Talmud, which is the the book of laws and regulations. Jesus took all 600 plus of those and encapsulated them down into one simple verse. But friends, it wasn't just one simple verse. What Jesus did was he went into the very roots of his own personal faith in Judaism to pull out that idea about loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And something known as the Shema. S-H-E-M-A. Jesus encapsulated this. The Shema is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Now, if you go and you look at Deuteronomy 6, 5, you'll see almost the entire verse right there as it was. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. What was omitted? Someone say mind. Mind. This is exactly right. It was mind. And so in the original Shema, it didn't mention loving the Lord your God with all of your mind. But Jesus adds that in there. Why do, you, why do you think that is? What do you think would be the, the cause or the purpose or the benefit of Jesus telling those who were trying to trip him and trick him, as well as those who were loyal followers, what would be the benefit of Jesus telling them to love God with their mind? What do you think? What do you think? He's asking them to engage their mental faculties. He says, think about it, right? Any Back to the Future fans? McFly, McFly, right? Think about it. Use your brain, use your noggin, use your noodle. You are to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. But I also want you to think about it. I want you to be aware of what's going on in the world. I want you to see the people around you. I want you to take these moments and these opportunities to think about how you can put your life into action by loving God and loving others. And so we get the Shema with Jesus' minor little addition, which isn't minor at all. So the Shema, you see the three points on the screen right there. And uh, if you're following along in the Hope Church Plus app, you will see the fill in the blanks with these. The Shema was the most important prayer in Judaism. It was prayed twice a day. First thing in the morning and last thing before going to bed. Hear, O Lord, the God is one. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It was the way that those in the faith started their day and finished their day. It was the bookend prayer for how they approached their lives. It was often believed that the Shema prayer were also the last words that a person would utter before his or her death about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Of course, Jesus added mine. But it's more than just a prayer. You'll see the second point, it means to hear and to do. Shema, literally translated from the Hebrew, means to hear. That's how that verse begins. 
It's, it's the, how the whole commandment begins. Hear, listen, the Lord our God is one. It's to hear. But it means more than just to hear. It also means to do. So we see this now we move into the third bullet point. Is it is a statement of faith and praise. But um, if we think about it even further, it's a statement of faith. But it is also a mission statement. This says what we believe and how we are to behave because of what we believe. Are you with me there? So it's a statement of faith, but it's also a mission statement. It says, this is what I believe, and this is how I am going to live as a result of what it is that I believe. It is putting our faith into action. That is the Shema. And so Jesus, as he comes back to those who are trying to trick and trip him, is think about what it is you believe, and then what is the implication for that in the way that you behave? Do you think those who are trying to trick and trip Jesus were living into the Shema when they, were, when they were challenging him. He's saying, think about it. Are you really truly living the way that you say you believe? And if not, why? And what is the implication of that? It's about making sure your belief and your behavior is consistent and congruent. If you were to picture a rainbow, so to speak, and we all want to go somewhere over the rainbow, right? We see the beginning, going back to Deuteronomy 6, with the original Shema. We see the, the pinnacle of that umbrella in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, when Jesus talks about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. These are the greatest commandments, in addition to loving God and loving others. But on the other side of that, we see something that Jesus taught his disciples that is captured for us in John chapter 15, verse 12. Which Jesus says, I'm going to give you a new commandment. And that is to love one another. That's how we will be known in the way that we love. So let's take a look at what that word love means. The word love that Jesus used in this, that is translated from the Aramaic into the Greek, which is the New Testament language, means Agape. And as you see on the screen, the definition for agape is to embrace God's will and obey God's way. So do you see how the connection between the Shema, to listen and to obey, comes back to, into the words that Jesus used and the words in which the Bible was written and translated, that all of this comes back to what it is that you believe and how it forms and shapes and changes your behavior. It's about loving God and loving others, embracing God's will, but also obeying God's way. Agape is, in the Greek, one of the three main terms that we, we use when we think about Greek love, or the word love in Greek. Um, agape is the unconditional love. It's the umbrella under which all other idea and understanding of love falls. Uh, another one is called eros, E-R-O-S, which is the romantic love. That's the love that we feel for our significant others, for our spices, you know, the ones that spice up life. And then we also have that filial love, which is the brotherly love. That's the friendship love, the love that we feel for our uh, really close friends and companions. But agape love is the umbrella under which all the others fall. It's an unconditional love that loves so passionately, so fervently, so brotherly, right, that we are willing to go to the ends of the earth for someone. To love. And this is the love that Jesus wants us to have. So when Jesus is translating or talking about loving God and loving others, connecting it from the Hebrew into the Greek, we see that loving God and loving other people is that unconditional love. And so now we flip the script, I say flip the script, but we see that verse from John 15, 12 that I mentioned before is that we are called to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we have, are to love others with the same type of unconditional love that he's given to us. It seems basic on the surface, but wow. Doesn't unconditional love get challenging? Especially if we feel hurt or betrayed or denied by someone that we love. But we are still to follow in that example of Christ. To love as he loves. Not loved. Jesus is. He's eternal as he loves us. 
and to love him with our whole heart. Loving God with our whole heart, one of the things that we're going to do when we talk about the heart and the soul and the mind and the strength is we're going to look at the connections from the Hebrew into the Greek that would have been familiar for Jesus at his time uh, and what's been translated into our biblical languages now. But the word for heart and the connections with the Hebrew and the Greek, we get the Hebrew, which is lebab. If you're into French, it's not lebab, it's lebab, right? In Hebrew, I believe in Hebrew, the accent goes in the first part of the first syllable. And so when we see it in the Hebrew, it means the interior or center of a person. The heart is the interior or the center of a person. Now, we connect it with our emotional center. This isn't precisely the way that the Hebrew word for interior or center, uh, this isn't exactly how it means. Because in the time of Jesus, when they talked about their emotional center, they were talking about their gut, right? So uh, you, you know what it, what it is to feel those things in your gut, right? Thumper talked about being all twitter pated when you get around somebody who you have uh, feelings, affectionate feelings for, right? We also know what it feels like to get anxious or worried or scared or even just on heightened alert. We feel it in our gut. So the emotional center at the time of Jesus was in the gut, where we feel the Twitter pain, where we feel the anxiety, we feel the worry, the fear. The anxiety, yes, yeah, I said anxiety already, but you get the point. That's where the emotional center was. For the Hebrew, it was more about the interior or the center of the person, which leads now into the Greek, which is cardia, right? We've heard that, EKGs, echocardiograms. But cardia is the center of your inward life. And look at that line beneath it. This points to the center of your life as in living from a point of human depravity or divine influence. That, my friends, is cool. Because what we see from the Greek here is that it is the center of us where we will either experience that divine influence, which is following God and learning to love God with all of our heart, or it can be the source of our human depravity. It's up to us, essentially. I love how Romans 12, bless you, I love how Romans 12 challenges us to love from the center of who we are. Love from the center of who you are. Run from what is evil. Flee from what is evil. Run to what is good. Keep fueled in a flame. Don't burn down. Find ways to practice hospitality and show others how important they are. The Apostle Paul tells us that we love from the center of who we are. But we have to be mindful of the idea about the heart. I think it was probably still Canadian Boxing Day, which is December 26th for our Canadian heritage, when all of the chocolate candies and cards for Valentine's Day began popping up in the stores. If I'm not mistaken, I did go to uh, Kroger the day after Christmas to get ready for our family gathering after we got done with worship. And I was amazed. It was like Christmas never happened, right? <laughs> we haven't even had our Christmas gathering with my side of the family yet. And it was already time for Valentine's Day. So you look around, you see all the, uh, the, the chocolate candies in the heart-shaped boxes and the conversation hearts and the teddy bears and things like that. And all of a sudden, we're just enraptured with the whole idea that uh, we're now in the season of love, right? And Valentine's Day really tries to capture that, doesn't it? Spend your money on chocolates and cards and goodies so you can show someone how you feel. And sometimes we do well with that, sometimes we don't. But however we oftentimes approach it, if someone calls us out or challenges us, what might be a response that you've either said or you've heard? Well, the heart wants what the heart wants, I declare. So, we're going to look at three different instances of how the Bible talks about the human heart and what that means for us. And all of these now are going to go back into the Old Testament because um, it's just so rich and so deep. The very first verse I want us to explore this morning comes from Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Which, this is where Jeremiah said, 
The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Wow, doesn't that just give you the warm fuzzies? Doesn't that make you want just a little piece of chocolate, right? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so when we read this and we put it in the context of, well, the heart wants what the heart wants, don't we see a point here? Is that the heart can deceive us. Our feelings can deceive us. Well, what does this mean? I thought we could trust our feelings. No. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, not in a moment. But one of the devil's most fertile playgrounds is in your feelings. What the devil wants to try to get you to do is to trust those feelings above the things that you can see and logically work your way through. Another plug for sermon in two weeks where you're trusting God and loving God with your mind. The devil wants you to trust your feelings. And I'm a big Star Wars fan, right? Trust your feelings. But it's got to be so much more than that because the devil is going to play in our feelings. He is going to try to get us to think that our feelings are fact. And they can't be. Our, flee- our feelings can be fleeting. And even when our feelings are fleeting, you may feel differently about the same thing depending on what kind of mood you're in, depending on who you're around, depending on what you had to eat last night, right? You mean to get some heartburn with it. You can change the way that you feel about something based on your circumstances and your situations. This is why Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things. The temptation is for us to think that we can trust our feelings, but we can't. And why is that? Because our feelings are the fertile playground of the enemy that is trying to deceive us and to get us to thinking that the things that we feel are indeed fact. We've got to filter those through our brain, but again, that's a message for two weeks from now. So, who can understand it? Who can understand the heart? Well, I'll tell you who. Someone more than just the great physician, the eternal cardiologist, right? Let's look at our next verse from Psalm 51, verse 10. This is where King David, after he has had such a terrible, traumatic failure, morally and ethically in his life, he prays this prayer to God, And this whole Psalm 51 is powerful, but this one verse is something I want to make sure that we pay attention to this morning. Where King David says, Create in me a pure heart and renew a loyal spirit within me. Create in me a pure heart. Do you know what the only muscle in the body is that doesn't regenerate itself? I'll give you a hint. We're talking about it today. Scientists used to think that it was the brain and the heart, but recent studies in neurology have indicated that the brain actually can regenerate itself some, but the heart can't. When the heart is damaged, it is damaged. We think about this from a physical or medical point of view and how we need a pure heart created within us, But this also has connections back to the scripture. We see it from the Old Testament into the New Testament, bookending the entire scripture, right? We keep talking about behave as you believe. God said repeatedly, the time will come when I am going to take their heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And on that heart of flesh, I am going to write and inscribe my laws and my commandments. And what are God's commandments? To love, right? We've already talked about it. To love God and to love others. God, God, Jesus, together, and the Holy Spirit guiding the whole thing. They want to remove our cold, hard heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh where his eternal creating and nail-scarred redeeming hand is writing his commandments of love on our heart so that we can love from the center of who we are. We need that eternal cardiologist to come and create in us a new heart. To remove the heart that is cold and hard. And to replace it with a heart of flesh and faith where God himself is writing his commandments to love. And to live based on that love within us. But there's something else in this verse that's really, really interesting. We see 
renew a what kind of spirit within me? Loyal. Why is that important? Because of what we saw in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is deceitful above all else. The heart wants what the heart wants. Well, sometimes what the heart wants is wrong. I tell you what, my heart wants to go eat a whole gallon of hot fudge right now. But it's not what's best for me. That actually isn't entirely true. Uh, but, you know, the heart wants what the heart wants. It's, it's deceitful. We need a new heart with a loyal spirit. A spirit loyal to whom? God. And the commandments that he's put in our lives. To love him and to love others. And yes, even to love self. To believe this and to behave accordingly. To agape. To embrace God's will and obey God's way. A loyal spirit. A spirit that knows that even when there are times we fall short, we are tempted, we can find in love that forgiveness, that mercy, that grace that God longs to give to us. We still have sin in our lives, don't we? But the scripture tells us that we are no longer driven or guided by sin. But that doesn't mean we sin, we are sin less, does it? But it does mean that we can sin less. Boy, that was supposed to be a lot more eloquent than it came out. I apologize for that. I'm going to say it again, a sip of water. And hopefully it'll come out to sound like I intended the first time. It doesn't mean we're going to be sinless, but it doesn't mean that you can sin less. Thank you. What we're talking about here, my friends, is to be guided by the love of God. When Jesus went to the cross, he took the penalty, received the punishment for all of our sinfulness, for our bent toward sinning, which means the heart is still deceived, but also down to the individual sins that we are aware of that no one knows about or those ones that we may not even know are in our lives. Jesus took them all to the cross and they were buried in that tomb which today still sits empty except for our sinfulness. They're buried. They're gone. And when Jesus died on the cross, his last three words were, it is finished. Referring to the power of sin over our lives and also the wrath of God as a result of sin. The wrath of God because of your sinfulness and my sinfulness from our attitude, how easily we are deceived to the little things that we do that we know about we don't even know about. The wrath of God is satisfied and we can find salvation through the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't mean we're going to be sinless. But it does mean we can sin less when we have that new heart within us and a spirit that is loyal to God. So what are we to do? Proverbs 4.23 gives us the answer. It says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Boy, isn't that true? So the very first verse that we looked at in Jeremiah 17 talked about the heart, how deceptive the heart can be. With those deceptions and those perceptions about how life is versus how we think it should be. But we know that God comes to remove our stone, hard, cold, legalistic heart to replace it with a, lot, with a heart of flesh where he's written his precepts and commandments of love in it. And so now we need to guard it because this new heart with the loyal spirit is what's going to determine the course of our lives. We must be loyal to God and to guard our heart. And go back to say, God, I know this is what you've commanded me to believe. Help me behave accordingly. Help me to put my heart as the center of who I am. And all of the things that I do that flows from the center of who I am. May it be love for you and for others as I consider even love of self. Hear and listen. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Love the Lord your God with the center of who you are. Recognize the tendency toward human depravity. 
and find the influence of God's designed spirit that is going to propel you forward because of the love that he has placed in your heart for your life. An unconditional love. This is even when we mess up and we miss the point, the target. We're not cast out, but we're restored. We are renewed, and we can find a spirit loyal to God back in our lives. Is there anyone in here who has not seen The Wizard of Oz? Okay, good. It's one of those things when Brent and Christian and I were planning the series, uh, Brent asked the question, and if you're all on the line this morning, Brent, hey, he said, I wonder if there are any of our particularly younger children who haven't grown up with The Wizard of Oz like I did, and like apparently all of us did. Most people have understanding in the precept of it, but I just was curious if there's anyone in here who hasn't seen it. If we were to go downstairs, the answers might be a little bit different, but, you know, that's for a later, later time. But the Tin Woodsman, he has a very, very interesting backstory that I want to share with you really quickly because it speaks to this whole idea about guarding our heart. The Tin Woodsman wasn't always made of tin. In fact, he was an Aussian, I guess that's the word you would say, lumberjack of sorts. He would go and he would chop down trees. His name was appropriately Nick Chopper. Now, his story is not told in The Wizard of Oz, but in some of the other novels and stories that are connected to The Wizard of Oz. And Nick Chopper was a man who was filled with love. In particularly, <clears throat> for this one fair maiden, it just so happened that the young maiden was a hand servant to the Wicked Witch of the East, the very same who had the ruby slippers that became available after a house was dropped on her when Dorothy made her way somewhere over the rainbow. And so Nick Chopper, he had these strong, hard, loving feelings for the maid, maiden of the Wicked Witch of the East. And the Wicked Witch of the East goes to Nick Chopper and says, I want to enchant your axe. And instead of enchanting it, she cursed it. So that whenever Chopper's feelings for the young lady with whom he felt attraction and affection, whenever they would well up inside of him, Chopper's axe would chop off a piece of his body. He had a friend in Oz who was a tinsmith. And this tinsmith, whenever Chopper would lose a part of him, would create a prosthetic limb or other body part, right? But he made it out of, you guessed it, tin. And as Chopper's feelings continued to grow for the young fair maiden, what he thought was once an enchantment became a complete and total curse where he lost all of himself and he was made entirely out of tin. The problem with the tinsmith, though, is even though he was very good at working with tin, there was one thing that he could not fashion for the one who once was Nick Chopper, who is now known as the Tin Woodsman. And can you guess what that was? A heart. You've seen the movie. And so at that point, the Tin Woodsman started on his quest and his journey to go find the Wizard of Oz in hopes that he could find a new heart. I think Nick Chopper's story and the Tin Woodsman's backstory is something that many, if not all of us, can relate to. There's a certain amount of love that we feel for the things of this world and Sometimes we think that it's an enchantment, and if we're not careful, it can take us over. And we can lose pieces of ourself when that love is about being self-serving and self-fulfilling. What God wants for you and for me and for all of us is to make our life of love not something about fulfilling self, but fulfilling God's commandment to love the world unconditionally with all of our heart. And so however it is that we find ourselves here today, we're going to close this morning, as we will, each of our messages in the series with a check of the part that we are called to love God wholly with. 
And today we're going to talk about our 10-man heart check. I want you to see these three questions on the screen. And I want you to give your own 10-man heart check for yourself this morning. <clears throat> Have you been deceived by your heart? Have you thought that the heart wants for the heart wants? And then you realize some bad decisions resulted in that. Have you found that what you once thought was an enchantment really became a curse? And you started living for self and not for God and for others. Which leads to the second question. Do you feel cursed by your sin? Do you feel like living this way, you are losing a piece of yourself each and every day or moment of every day? Do you feel like you are losing the grip on how it is that God wants you to love from the center of who you are? Well, here's the good news for you, my friend. Is that... Even though the tinsmith in Oz could not create a heart, I know someone who can. And his whole goal is to create within you a new heart, driven by a loyal spirit for him. So will you allow God to renew your heart and to keep it guarded? Will you allow God to come and remove that cold and hard heart that you have, or the heart of flesh, where he himself has written on it the commandments and precepts which are to love? This is your heart check, your 10 men heart check. Have you allowed your life to be deceived? Do you feel cursed as a result? If so, turn to our eternal cardiologist who wants to teach you how to love unconditionally from the center of who you are to follow a life moved by divine influence and not human depravity. As Christian and Brittany come and make their way to the stage this morning to close us in our last song, I'm going to offer an invitation for you. If you are here this morning and you have found any of those three questions to be applicable for you today, where you've been deceived by your heart, it's caused you to be deceived into sin and cursed, and you need God to guard your heart and to renew that right and loyal spirit within you, I want you to come to the front this morning. You can stay and pray in your seat too if you'd like, but I want you to just come and spend some time with God and say, God, I acknowledge I've been deceived by my heart. I need a new heart and I need it to have a loyal spirit. And I need Almighty God for you to help me guard it because I know life flows from it. So let me love from the center of who I am and make a difference for you and for others and even myself in this world. Join me in prayer, please. Living and loving God, I thank you for today and I thank you for the gift of love. Forgive us when we make it about ourselves, when we allow our lives to be deceived. By thinking the heart wants what the heart wants and we trust our feelings over the things that we can see and that we know to be true. And so, Almighty God, I pray that you may restore our heart, renew it, and write your precepts and your commandments for love on it. And to help us to guard it because we know that our life does indeed flow through it. And so, Lord God, for those this morning whose hearts are making a turn back to you, I know that there are celebrations erupting in eternity right now where the streets are paved with gold. And so help us to follow that yellow brick road, not just for destination, but the way that we are called to live right now with a heart directed and loyal to you by the love that you've given for us and have asked us to share with you and with the world. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.